Welcome to Godsplaining, contemplative preachers, contemporary age. Each week, join the Dominican friars as they consider all things Catholic. Hello and welcome back to Godsplaining. I am Father Gregory Pine, joined here by Father Jacob Bertrand Janzik. Father Jacob Bertrand, you are in sunny and humid Washington, D.C., apart from the weather, which is often a point of much discussion. How are things? Fine. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> it is neither sunny nor terribly humid in D.C., uh -huh. which reminded me of a time when we were at some talk thing. I think it was, um, oh, what was it called? When we go to, I can't remember Theology what it's called. Nope, not Theology on Tap. It was like on Capitol Hill, some people's houses we would go to. Mm, these Christopolis. Talks. Christopolis, yeah, we would go to this thing, and one time, different people would come and give a talk. It was kind of like a young adult Capitol Hill thing. And Father Gregory and I were, when we were both first back at Thousand Studies, we were kind of ha helping handle the group for the first for that one year. And Father Gregory introduced one of our <laughs> one of our brothers, one of the friars of the province, who was giving a talk on uh, whatever it doesn't matter, but like said everything, and it was all <laughs> wrong. Like wrong year that he entered the order, wrong ordination date, wrong call. Like everything was wrong. So uh, it was just hilarious. It was really well. Uh, yeah, it was great. And this friar was had to reintroduce himself and correct everything that Father Gregory said. So um, I don't know why it's so funny, but it's funny to me, nonetheless. All these it years is. later, years and years later. Ah, uh, yes. Such time that has passed. Uh, it was kind of funny to me, too. Um, although I felt somewhat, what would one say, put out by it. I was like, listen, I, I I make everything up. I'm a horseshoes and hand grenades man. I, I'm just surprised I got as close as I did to most of your specifics. <laughs> I knew but your yeah, first took, and last name, so yeah, exactly. He took great umbrage. I was like, well, okay, well, we'll make it through. Um, no, he was he was gracious about it. Okay, yeah. So um, here we go. Today's episode is going to be a deep psychological dive. Let's go. Uh, many people about, whether here or there, whether hither or thither, tend to think that being nice is a good thing. Maybe you've had some senior superlatives voted on in your high school class and you were hoping for, you know, most successful or best dress, but instead you got most nicest. Uh, and this for you was an occasion of great horror because while many of us think that to be nice is good, we also have the seeking suspicion that to be nice also means to be like a doormat, to be spineless, to be otherwise conflict averse. So we're of two minds when it comes to the virtue of niceness. I myself am a kind of conflict averse person, whereas Father Jacob Bertrand, I don't know if I would say that you are pro conflict, but I would say that you cringe less at the thought of it than I do. Um, so we thought that it would be a fruitful dialogue given our different approaches to the matter to discuss what about niceness is in fact nice and what about niceness is in fact not nice. So, Father Jacob Bertrand, when people talk about nice, what are they talking about? Can you set us up? Yes. But first, <laughs> did you win any high school superlatives? <laughs> You're going to actually be dumbfounded when I tell you this. I was runner okay. up for best dressed. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, Woo! Really? Yo, oh, yeah. Wait, I used to true? actually care. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I used to gosh. care about clothing. Um, or at least dressing just, myself like a human being. Yeah, for, for all of those who, <laughs> I mean, well, he, Father Gregory wears a religious habit all the time now. Uh, not, I would say like most all the time. And I've only known him since we've been in the order. But when he is not in the habit and I see him, my, my thought is usually like, dear God, what? Okay, uh, we're doing this. Uh, it, it's, not, it's not the worst, but it's, it is not a superlative worthy. It is superlative worthy, just not for best dress. But that's awesome. Woo. Bless your heart. Yeah. How about you? Wow. Did you win any? I think so. Yes, um, yes you did. Yeah, I did. <laughs> I won Aww. two. Uh, I won most likely to succeed. Um, nice. Here I am succeeding. <laughs> and I won most sarcastic. Here I am just <laughs> succeeding sarcastically. So winner, winner. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That is yeah. a perfect lead-in so, then to the subject of this topic because yeah, niceness and I, sarcasm 
are often put at loggerheads, but you're going to help yeah. us to find a way to be both yeah, nice it's fine. and sarcastic? Can, no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, I don't think you can, no, I think we have to get rid of one and one that doesn't matter. And the one that doesn't matter is being nice. So we're going <laughs> to, we're going to talk about why that's a, a, a sort of stupid, nonsensical thing. Uh, wow. Whoa. I threw down. Yeah, Father Gregory yeah. said we had different approaches to this. So, yeah, here here it is <laughs> different. <laughs> being nice is worthless. Uh that's my that's my two cents. Um at least being nice in the the sense that our that has been built up as a sort of secular virtue of like the ultimate kind of thing. I think is is a load of hooey. I don't know. I can't <laughs> say anything. I don't I'm trying to think of a word that's not a curse word and that's a little stronger than that but that's what i came up with so um so what is my problem with it my problem is that is this that often you know the secular world and and too a lot of a lot of times in ecclesial circles um you know you, you like whatever whether whether it's like a parish program or like intercessions at the sunday mass or what you know talk about being nice or kind as if these things constitute holiness or as if these things were kind of theological or even cardinal or moral virtues and and that like somehow we have to signal that we're good people by you know being nice and being kind and being um inclusive in these ways not that inclusivity is in itself a bad thing but that these are the height of like civic and and moral duty and i they just simply they simply aren't when we're when they're used in this way um why aren't they well well i mean i've I'm not a, I don't have the scriptures memorized. I've read them and I've read them a few times. Uh, I could be wrong. So please don't send me an email with like a proof text line from the scriptures because I won't reply. Uh, but I don't seem to recall that, you know, the scriptures talk about, you know, blessed is he who is nice or that being crucified was a nice thing or that, you know, Christ was being kind when he, when he told people to go and sin no more. I don't seem to find that anywhere in the context content of revelation in the way that, uh, you know, our secular friends would like to kind of beat us over the head about being nice. Um, now you might say, well, what about the golden rule? What about Matthew seven twelve? Mm, do unto others as you would have them do to you. Okay, fine. Um, but that still doesn't, you know, being nice. Sure. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know if that counts. Um, the real problem here that I see is that that being nice, you know, lauding this sort of nice reality, lauding this sort of you have to be kind, is that th that we easily fall into into the categories of relativism and subjectivism, and that what constitutes me being nice to one person might look very different for what another person thinks as being nice. Uh, what you know, what constitutes being nice might be super subjective and not actually correspond to the truth. Being nice might be like, you know, not holding to truth, church teaching and the truth of, of our faith because it offends people. Well, in the end, I don't, it, you know, I'm not saying be offensive for offensive, being offensive sake, but that, you know, if that means that I can't be nice to everybody because I don't um, agree with the way by which the world has, has understood the human person in the last 25 years, well, then so be it. You know, that's, that's where my mind is on it. I don't know, Father Gregory, if you have thoughts on what I said or your own thoughts, but at least that's setting the scene, uh, laying it out for uh, for everybody. And I think if you've listened to more than four minutes of this episode, you've you've probably realized that I'm not that nice all the, all the time. <laughs> and maybe I'm just making excuses for my own behavior, but at least there's the rationale that I'm justifying my own behavior with. So there you have it. So I think you know what we're what we're motivated by. What we ultimately want to cultivate is a life of virtue, and so we want to be able to identify true virtues and grow in the in the ones that we identify. Uh, and we'll devote the second half of the episode to just that. But I think that the gospel is addressed to real human beings with real human needs, with real human problems. And if people esteem niceness for whatever reason. Uh, I think it's because they see niceness as addressing some genuine human reality. So maybe, uh, you know, in anticipation of the break, we could just talk a little bit about that. See if we can mine what it is that motivates people to be nice and to want nice done unto them. So I'm thinking about my own experience. Okay, so I live in Switzerland, and I have some dealing with service employees in Switzerland. So I haven't yet been to a restaurant um, uh, because all of them have been closed for as long as I've been here. Uh, although they opened up since I came back. 
Regardless, I have been to a couple places. Like I went to get an eye exam at an optometrist because I had to get an eye exam in order to get an international driver's license. And uh, the internet in my house is suboptimal. So I got an, an internet plan at the phone store and I had to like renew my immigration, whatever, visa. Uh, so I had to go to the people at whatever SPOMI stands for. Um, that place. Okay. Uh, and That's so it, French. That was yeah, crazy. exactly. At each of these locales, I dealt with service professionals, and some of them uh, were not nice to me, and some of them were nice to me. So like the woman, for instance, that the optometrist was just incredibly kind, warm, wonderful. I was so pumped, actually, by that encounter. It was short. It was efficient. I paid. I left. The guy at the uh, phone store, also a gem. Um, shout out to Brian. If you're listening to this, you are the man. Um, the word s'embrasser is a little bit ambiguous in French. It can mean either uh, to hug or to kiss. And I was so overjoyed by the fact of his resolving my problems that I, that I told him that I wanted to hug him. But based on his reaction, I think that he thought that I meant the other sense of that word. So um, let's just say that I esteem niceness in a service professional because I feel like I am seen, I feel like I am taken care of, and I feel like I can face the day speaking a language in which I stink and, you know, whatever, not have to eat pounds and pounds of chocolate just to make it to bedtime. So that for me is, that for me is not nothing. So what is it there? Like what's at the heart of that? What are we, uh, what are we describing when we describe those types of experience where, where niceness seems a great healing balm or a boon or whatever? Yeah, I, I agree with you on all of that. And I think that, um, and I think that there, there is a real sort of virtue or we can identify virtues there. Um, that are that fall in line with 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 real virtues and real kind of real things that constitute and build up holiness, or at least even we can like even civic virtue and which are which are not wasted virtues. Um, and but I would I would identify uh, what's like what's of value in that other than simply being nice. Um, you know, there there and we'll talk about one of the you know, like a couple of these virtues, and as Father Gregory signaled in the second half, particularly like affability, the virtue of affability. Does that kind of sound like niceness in some ways? It does, but let's. I think what's what's at what's important for for me to get at and for us to get at in this episode is that is that these the the these virtues are 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 rooted in in true um, substantial virtues that direct us to the good and direct us um, objectively to that good and to the good end. So. What what worries me about a sort of um, kind of foundationless or just a really subjective niceness is that it doesn't necessarily lead one to goodness, truth, beauty, holiness, happiness. Um, it can be easily masked or, or easily mask a sort of lack of those things um, and just be nice for being, you know, niceness for nicenesses. There's a lot of S's. Niceness mm. for nicenesses sake. Just to put on... Um, you know, a sort of a front, uh, a front that, that, you know, might ease tensions in a situation, but isn't ultimately where the, the foundation of good Christian living is, is found. Another, another like scripture example that comes to mind is, is the, um, is the parable of the good Samaritan, you know, when the Samaritan helps and rescues the, the, uh, or when the Samaritan is rescued or no, the Samaritan does the rescuing. Wow. Confusing. There goes all of my credibility with scripture. <laughs> you know, there, there is, we could say like the Samaritan is being, is being nice, perhaps. I mean, that would be categorized as a good thing. You know, he's being, he's being kind, he's being nice to this, to this injured and dying man. But is that really at root, like the, the height of virtue of just being nice? Was he just being nice? No, of course not. There was, there was this great act of charity, which is really, which really constitutes his actions there. So I think it's important for us to to recognize that yeah there are interpersonal um interpersonal skills that that conduce to like professionalism and ple being pleasant and and all that and I I'm all about all of that uh and I, and I and I guess just to sort of like sensationalize my dislike of the virtue of being nice I you know I you know I'm just I've I've been described as being extreme in my opinions so whatever I'm extreme in my opinions <laughs> so uh but again, to reiterate what I'm saying, it's like let's let's look at actually what constitutes um, the virtues of inner human interaction and human relationship that redound to the truth and to our holiness. And I don't think simply being nice lives up to that lives up to that bill. 
One other element that I would want to throw into the mix is the recognition that many of us are fragile. So this is mm -hmm. often remarked of millennials and Gen Z that um, we are constantly in need of affirmation. We find it very, very difficult to accept and to process criticism. And so we're always on the brink of a kind of crisis. And I think that in, in part two, we value niceness because it buffers us from the difficulty of life and it helps us, you know, maybe we grow along the way, but it, it helps us to kind of take reality in bite-sized portions. And so th this might be, as we, you know, kind of lead in the second half to a description of the pertinent virtues, it might be a way by which to situate that discussion, because I think how you comport yourself will depend on the other human being. And that's not to say, like, you're nice with people who you don't know, but you really rough up those whom you do, because roughing them up is the way best conducive to their growth and virtue. No, that's, that's not it. But if I were just to meet a person and I would say, like, hey, um, your breast smells real bad, you should either brush or floss or wash, you know, like mouthwash or all of the above, or also see a doctor about it because it, it smells like a nursing home just like died. All of, all of the residents of the nursing home died. Um, right. So that might not be the move. The person might benefit from that, but given his or her fragility, given the fact that we just met, that might not be the appropriate thing. And so maybe there's some niceness that's called for there. Whereas if, you know, I've been friends with somebody for 10 years and that person has some seriously nagging things that need addressing. And I myself am too quote unquote nice to actually confront them. Then we're dealing with something here that's, that's disordered. Uh, we're, we're dealing with an actual lack of or kind of breakdown in the life of virtue. So looking then towards virtue, we'll speak about that in the second half. Stick with us and we'll catch you on the other side. You are listening to Godsplaining. Visit us at godsplaining.org to listen to our episodes, shop our store, and donate to our podcast. All gifts go to improving the podcast and bringing the gospel to more listeners. Thanks for your support. All right, welcome back to God's Planning. We are talking about the pseudo virtue of niceness. Spoilers, it's not one. Um, that's what pseudo signifies in that here introduction. Uh, but what we are talking about <laughs> are the pertinent virtues which help us to be, you know, generous, kind, loving, of service to another. Uh, these are the real things which can actually shape our affection, shape our desires, shape our actions such that they conduce to the glory of God and the salvation of souls. So, Father Jacob Bertrand, if you want to kind of map, up, map out for us the lay of the land, give us an insight into some of the virtues which contribute to our being this way. Yeah. When you, when you said lay of the land, I was, uh, the first half of the, this is wholly tangential, but I just want to say what I want to say, so I'm trying to make a connection. <laughs> uh, uh, in the first half of the episode, or off, okay, yeah, I was thinking about it then, and then often I think being from like New England and, you know, the Northeast, we sometimes have the reputation of just being a little more cold, whereas like, you know, opposed to other parts, Midwest or like the South that are, you know, super friendly and, and kind of welcoming. So I wonder if that, if my like this sort of, um, subconscious reality just contributes to my to my sort of disdain of of niceness you know like going to the grocery store going out in the street like i don't want to talk to anybody i just want to get what i want to get and go back home and i think that's nice like leave me alone whereas like if someone's like how you do where you but it's like mm, don't don't ask me where i'm going that's none of your business don't ask me what i'm doing also none of your business and you're slowing me down like okay. so that's <laughs> that's also going on and i recognize that that's like cold and calloused and okay fine Maybe the fault's with me. Probably not. Usually not. But, you know, there it is. So <laughs> virtues that actually contribute to, uh, to the to the upbuilding of, of holiness and the kingdom. Um, and I think that that reality is it really situates our conversation, um, especially when we, you know, when we talk about our interactions with other people. Um, I've been avoiding using the word friendship because here we're not really talking about that, like, close, intimate friendship of how that's built. But like, how, how do we interact in, in, in like civic public discourse relationships going to like get coffee whatever um it, it, it's really important to remember that even those interactions that might not have the sort of deep lasting realities to them ought to build um work to upbuild our holiness ought to be opportunities to show forth um the reality of the christian life and, and witness to christ and build up the kingdom even in these passing interactions so what are the virtues that do that how are we how are we helped 
in acting in that way. So, so as to do that, I think we should look at two virtues, one theological, one, um, one moral or cardinal and a few of their parts. So the first would be charity and we'll, we'll I don't know, maybe gloss over this a little more quickly. Um, but there are two parts of, t- of the virtue of charity, two virtues, two sub virtues, we could say of the virtue of charity that, that fall, that fall here. And I think are worth attention in, in, um, in our thoughts here. The first one of those is mercy. And I think that particularly with what Father Gregory was talking about at the end of the first half of the episode, uh, that that millennials can be, and, and other people too, but particularly sensitive or uh, need more affirmation perhaps than like past generations. That's true. I think that's true of, of us and of our peers and of people just younger than us. Um, why is mercy important rather than niceness? Uh, why is mercy actually a virtue? Well, mercy, uh, mercy is is really ultimately, you know, it's God's love for us in the face of our sin. And we participate in being merciful in as much as we recognize. Um, I often compare mercy to tolerance, which I also think is cheap and and kind of often abused and then results in being a stupid reality. Uh, but tolerance becomes, you know, this kind of recognizing of where somebody is and simply accepting that, whether that's without sort of a, a recognition of whether where they are is good or bad, whereas mercy recognizes where somebody is, but but loves them and calls them to the perfection to that to which they're called in appropriate and prudent ways, you know, like bad breath correcting, as Father Gregory mentioned at, at first meeting, probably isn't terribly merciful, but more would be more hurtful. Um, but mercy calls those with whom we interact, even in these passing interactions, to some greatness. It gives them the room to exercise who they are, and their humanity, um, in ways that are that are that build up the kingdom and. Um, yeah, call them to to some to some real virtue, some real holiness. Uh, the other one here, and I'll just list it, and then Father Gregory chime in and you know say what you want to say. Say that I'm wrong. It's fine. Um, is is the idea of fraternal correction? Um, fraternal correction is a, a virtue or, or a virtuous action that falls under the virtue of charity. Why do we correct somebody? Why do we lead somebody? Why do we um, lead? Yeah, correct somebody when there's a fault. Um, it's not because we're superior, um, but because we love them because we want them to pursue holiness, to pursue goodness, to pursue truth. Uh, so here, sometimes, you know, with, with the thought of mercy and fraternal correction as recognizing where someone is and who they are, but also calling them to something greater, it might require us not to be quite so nice in the, in the sort of lauded secular sense, because it's sometimes a painful or difficult conversation or interaction to have. Um, but ultimately, uh, that that contributes to to the upbuilding of holiness and, and the kingdom. So, with thoughts of charity, I think that that offers us a little bit more to think about than simply just being nice on my terms. Yeah, when, when Saint Thomas talks about charity, he describes a virtue. He describes its interior dimensions, and then he describes its exterior dimensions. And you know, he talks first about just you know what he calls beneficence, good doing, and then mercy, alms deeds. And then fraternal correction. And when you think about it in one way, it's like mercy is with respect to those who are poor, and fraternal correction is with respect to those who are wrongdoers. And the goal in both instances is to dignify the other person. So in the case of mercy, you lift them up, right? So you're moved or you're kind of struck to the core at the recognition of their miserable state. And then you exercise some kind of power or some kind of authority, and you relieve them of what it is that causes their miserable state. And then in the case of fraternal correction, you see that there's, you know, uh, a splinter in your brother's eye, and cognizant of the beam in your own eye, you do what you can to help him or her remove it, right? But in both cases, the idea is that you're lifting someone up, you're, you're dignifying someone. And I think that that gives us a good insight into what's really at the heart of niceness, right? We said, The other person may be fragile, the other person might be easily offended, the other person might just be ill at ease, the other person might just be anxious in his or her own skin. And what real virtue does is it doesn't say, like, you're fine where you are, like you described tolerance. Real virtue dignifies the other person. Real virtue um, accompanies them on their march, on their pilgrimage, as it were, to God, which ultimately entails, you know, growth in virtue or growth in holiness for themselves. Um, so yeah, those, those are both, you know, like really strong forms of kindness. They're not just kind of weak UBU forms of kindness. They're strong forms of kindness. Um, so with that, then maybe we could talk a little bit about 
justice? You want to pick out some some pertinent features of justice? Yeah. When when St. Thomas talks about justice and the virtue of justice, he he identifies three types of justice. Two I don't care about right now, legal and distributive <laughs> justice. Uh, the third is commutative justice. Uh, and the commutative justice is the justice uh, that often when you think about justice, rendering another his due between two equals is is really uh, what we're kind of after here what, what, when we think about. Um, so it's defined or we can think of it as this like constant and perpetual or this like, yeah, constant will of one person of me uh to render another person what is what is his due or her due in equity so what is another person owed and we can think of this in terms of um kind of like monetary or material things you know if i get in a car accident i have to pay back you know i have to make make amends for if the accident's my fault i don't have to i can't pay less than what the damage was and i shouldn't pay more either there's an equity there but we can also think of this in terms of relational qualities and and what is and just as Father Gregory was explaining, recognizing the dignity of another person and lifting them up. You know, what does another person do in in his or her humanity uh, in my relationship with them? What do they do in my my relating to them as as one human being to another human being, whether they're a peer of mine, whether they're a stranger, whether they're uh, a homeless or a per, poor person, whether they're you know some great public, you know, with respect to who they are as a man or a woman, what do they do? And uh, what is their dignity? And I think in that lies the the real ability to interact in a kind way or in a nice way that that we're, we look at people not as objects to be, oh, that's so good for you or pitied or uh, kind of exalted beyond what they are, but as human beings. And if we begin to 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 interact in that kind of way, uh, we can we can actually again contribute to the building of holiness in the kingdom of God. Now, I, I'll list. I think there are there are some sub virtues or parts of the virtue of um, of justice that are worth our looking at, and and I'll list them quickly, and then we can both the two of us can talk about them. And there are four, as I think I just said. Um, the first is gratitude, and these all pertain to justice. So gratitude, affability equity and liberality. Again, so gratitude, affability, equity, and liberality. Uh, I think these are really helpful in these in, in situating our, our good interactions with other people. I don't know if you have thoughts about them or others to add to the list. We can, we can explain them quickly too, but there you have a little list. Rather than kindness and niceness, uh, we have these, these virtues, these sub-virtues of, of justice that help us interact better with, with others. Yeah, so when St. Thomas goes through these sub-virtues, he, he groups some together which concern uh, a kind of obedience due to a superior. So there you'd have like religion or piety or obedience properly. And then he groups together what, what other authors have called these virtues of civility. So they're the types of justice that need to be present in a polity, for instance. You know, that's kind of like the context that he's thinking of. For it to go well. And they're kind of hard to pin down because it's not clear how much gratitude you owe to another person. It's not always clear how much affability you owe towards another person. But there has to be something there in order for your social life to proceed well and happily. And basically, that's the idea. It's the goal in the, in the polity is the cultivation of virtue, right? So the virtue of the citizenry and a kind of unity among them. And those wheels are greased by these virtues, um, which help you to live in close quarters with people who may be of um, different family, different ethnicity, different religious commitments, etc., uh, with whom you might, in an ordinary sense, kind of find yourself at odds ends, but are forced by the context to be of one mind and heart, at least in some sense. And these are the types of virtues which help you to accomplish that goal. So, like gratitude, you know, like you are, you owe a kind of thanks to your to your benefactor. Affability, you owe a kind of like kindness, right, or friendliness to all those whom you meet. Like the difference between having a a, a chipper bank teller in the morning and a dour bank teller in the morning can tell you know, the next two hours can, can kind of give indication of how the rest of your morning will, will transpire. Or like liberality, we owe a certain generosity. Like if, if, if you're in a group of friends and everyone is just kind of looking suspiciously at the other to see if someone will offer to pay, you're in a, you're in a strange setting. At a certain point, you know, mindful of your income and mindful of what is actually possible for you, 
We need to be poised, you know, to treat to ice cream. We need to be poised to treat to parking, even if it's a dollar fifty for the next day. Things like that. They're the types of things which bring us together so that we're not always looking out for ourselves, getting ours, and looking at other people as obstacles or competitors. Yeah, often we think of justice too as this kind of like um, you know, very kind of cold, calculating uh, adjudication in our relationships of what is owed and what's not owed. And I'm only going to give what's owed. But here we, we can push back and say, well, well, no, because as, as Father Gregory was pointing out, St. Thomas has, he talks about these forms of justice, but then he also, the, these sub virtues, as we're talking about gratitude, affability, equity, liberality, these, these call us to something beyond the letter of the law, right? They call us to be, um, to be like givers in our relationship with other people, to be self-giving to in our relationships with other people. So like to, to go back to gratitude for a moment, um, when a benefactor, when someone gives us something, we're given something without the expectation that something be returned when a gift is given. You know, a gift is given and that's kind of it. It's not, we're not paying for a service, we're receiving a gift. But even here, um, you know, St. Thomas will point out, well, yes, but you know, even when we're given something with the without the expectation of a return, we still ought to give something back. We still, even if that's, you know, just a sense of gratitude, of thankfulness, because it allows relationships to flourish beyond just a mere equitable exchange of me, you know, exchanging money for this service or service for that money. Same thing with, with, um, with, with this idea of equity. So here, Thomas is talking about this idea of going beyond just the, the base letter of the law to give more than re what's required from our material possessions, our spiritual wealth, like whatever it might be, so as to, to, build, um, to build up one another in our humanity and in our pursuit of holiness. And I think when we think about like, charity and justice and mercy and fraternal correction, and then this, this gratitude and affability and liberality and equity, we can begin to see here that there's a real foundation for uh, virtuous interactions that goes beyond just a sort of a smile. Not that a smile is bad. We should smile at people. We should, but we should also recognize that like there's a reason that we treat people this way. And it's not just because the world tells us we should do that or we're, or, you know, we're, we're bad people, but really we should treat people well. We should behave, you know, like, like the, the receptionist at Greg, Father Gregory's dentist office or the, the guy at the cell phone store. We should behave in these kind of ways because we recognize the, the dignity of the person, uh, because we recognize that God has the highest calling for them and that we are actually real contributors in their pursuit of those things, even if they don't recognize it, even in a passing moment. Um, we can actually help them along in, in their pursuit of Christ. And there's a real, there's a real beauty to that um, that's not founded on our subjectivism or relativization of what's nice and kind, but on, on real virtue, on real love, on real justice, on real, on real uh, holiness. Boom. So if the takeaway is no, nice is not a virtue, the reason for which isn't because we're down on being nice or kind. The reason for which is you're called to something more. You're called to something infinitely more real, more thick, more substantial. You're called to be virtuous. So with that, I think we'll leave you at the, at the takeaway there of be virtuous, don't settle for being nice. Uh, a special thanks to all of our Patreon uh, supporters. We're very grateful for that, which makes the podcast possible. Uh, and if you uh, have considered but haven't yet uh, given a donation through Patreon, please, please do consider or continue to consider or then do uh, that. We're very grateful for those uh, who do, and it's just all, all, all of those proceeds basically go to making the podcast better. It just all gets turned back into the podcast to improve quality, to improve reach, and to help other people hear the good word that they might be led uh, to the knowledge and love of God. I just got a text message from somebody today who said, my dad started listening to God's planning. He recommended that I listen to it, and I just got baptized. And I was like, let's go! Uh, so that's awesome. Um, other things, uh, do check out increased offerings from guest planning and from live planning. We've mentioned those on other episodes and you can find them uh, on the appropriate platforms. And then, uh, yeah, we, we continue to proffer our prayers and celebrate masses for you. So please do continue to pray for us and we'll look forward to chatting with you next time on God's Planning. Thanks for listening to God's Planning, a work of the Dominican Friars of the province of St. Joseph. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Leave a review on your podcast app and visit us at godsplaining.org.